Hello and welcome once again to episode 34 of Code Completion. We are a group of iOS developers and educators hoping to share what we love most about development, Apple technology, and completing your code. My name once again is Dimitri and I'll be your host for this episode. And I'm joined today by my fellow completionist, Spencer. Hey guys. So before we get into our main topic, it's time once again for Indie App Spotlight. Uh, first app, uh, first up, first app uh, is uh, Word Counter by Christian Tietz. A Mac app, status bar app that keeps track of how many words you type into individual applications. Uh, so it encourages you to write more by showing you your daily output uh, and keeps a history divided by app and even project um, organized into helpful graphs and chart always at your uh, mouse click. Um, so you can support Christian by purchasing Word Counter on his website for a one time license of only uh, $19.99. And uh, finally, we have Pro Ledger by Andy Nadal, an iPhone and iPad app that helps you keep track of your finances. Pro Ledger helps you keep track of all your accounts, transactions, and budgets, reminds you when payments are due, and summarizes the week with intuitive charts and graphics. So Pro Ledger is available for $5.99 as a paid app on the iOS App Store. Uh, so please give it a try to support Andy. And if you are an indie app, uh, not if you're an indie app, but if you're an indie app developer that makes indie apps, uh, we want to hear from you. Please reach out to us on Twitter at Code Completion via DM uh, so we can spotlight your app as well. Uh, so on to our main topic. Uh, last time we had an overview of all things server-side Swift. Uh, so that way, if you're thinking about it, you might want to get into it. Uh, and this time we thought we might do an overview of uh, the various graphic frameworks that are available on uh, iOS and macOS, since there are quite a few of them um, at this point. Uh, so Spencer, if you need to do graphics, what's your go-to graphics framework? Well, that's a big loaded question because it just <laughs> depends on what you're trying to do. <laughs> you don't have so, a favorite? I No, I mean, all not the, really. All the frameworks are crying in the background. <laughs> that's okay. I love them all equally, just like my children that I don't have. Um, anyway, um, yeah, no, it really does depend because, uh, you know, if you're just doing something simple, you want to style a table view, just use UI kit for the most part, probably, right? You can, uh, just use, you know, constraints if that even counts as necessarily a graphics framework, or if you're just using uh, constraints to sort of lay out the visual elements themselves, UI buttons, UI table views, all that kind of stuff. You know, app kit, UI kit is is great for a lot of things. And if you want to keep something, um, how would I say, I guess fairly like stock, fairly standard, that's probably great. Um, but like Dimitri said, we've got other things that can let us do uh, more complex um, operations, I suppose, visually. Um, so like core graphics, for example, is probably uh, the next sort of lowest level thing where you could start digging into each view's layers and start changing their borders and uh, their border widths, uh, the, the colors of the borders, all that stuff. Um, you could start drawing your own views. You could say, hey, I'm going to make a completely custom view. And you tell uh, the view exactly how to look. And so it's less of a pre-made, hey, here's your button. But you could say, yeah, I want to make a button that looks like a triangle or something, I guess. you know. It's just more control, and so I guess those were those would be the ones that I've used the most. Um, and then you know you've also got like Swift UI now, so that's that's an option as well, which is I'd say sort of on the same level of AppKit UI Kit uh, level of sort of uh, accessibility ease of kind of getting into. But again, it, it has its limits uh, in a way. So let let's concentrate on that example of uh, the hypothetical triangle button. Um, so there are quite a way, a few ways of building such a button. You could just generate a triangle in your graphics app of choice uh, as a uh, PNG yeah. file or a PDF. Uh, and then you can just assign that as a UI image on your button and you have a triangle button. Uh, now, depending on the framework you're using, that triangle button will like react more like a square as in if you click on the empty part of the triangle, uh, where a square would have like encompassed it, that would still click. Um, whereas with some frameworks like Swift UI, uh, it's able to actually j map out exactly where there are pixels. Um, so if you have a Swift UI button and you assigned an image as its label, 
uh, then only the, the opaque parts of the triangle would be uh, clickable unless you added some extra uh, modifiers on that image. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Um, or you can get into the nitty gritty, uh, like Spencer said. So both AppKit and UIKit, uh, they're based on views. And these views, you can draw directly within them. So a view has a method called draw rect. And basically, it's asking you to provide the image data that would represent that view at that given point. So it sets up the context and all that for you. And you are expected to just go ahead and draw. If you're using like UIKit or AppKit, you usually have a few high level uh, drawing primitives available to you. So for instance, uh, if you wanted to draw a triangle, that's uh, basically a polygon where you move to a point and then you move to another point, move to a third point and say fill. Um, so that's the easiest way to kind of get a triangle. Um, and in AppKit, you have N NS Bezier path. Um, and in UIKit, you have UI Bezier path um, and both of these basically work the same. They will grab the current context magically, uh, and then they will just go ahead and draw when you tell them to fill themselves. Um, now, all of this is built on top of core graphics, uh, and core graphics will go ahead and do the actual drawing to an image buffer, uh, but you need to get a context first. So if you're in the uh, if you're in a draw rect call, basically you need to ask for the context from AppKit or UIKit first. Um, and there are methods for this to make it easy. Uh, but once you have that context, then you can go ahead and directly use uh, something called CG path ref, uh, which you, UI Bezier path and NS Bezier path are built on top of. Uh, so a lot of these technologies are just wrapping the one below them. Um, and uh, on modern Mac OS and, I, and forever, for, uh, like forever since iOS came out, uh, what this will do is it will render an image basically and then assign it to a layer that your system will then put on screen. Mm -hmm. uh, something that helped me like when I was learning about um, basically dropping down into core graphics and using these uh, Bezier paths is if you've ever used an app like Photoshop or um, Affinity Photo, uh, any, any, or Sketch even, um, you've probably seen those like shape tools with uh, rectangles, squares, triangles. Uh, the pen tool, for example, is really uh, what a UI Bezier path does. You say, go to this point, then go to this point. You can even add control points to these UI and NS Bezier paths. Uh, and that's, that's really all you're doing. And you're saying, mm -hmm. uh, fill this or make a stroke or a border around whatever shape you make. And so, uh, like Dim Dimitri said, you could just say, go here, 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 make a triangle, fill it. But you can get really complex because of these um, control points and essentially draw whatever you want. Um, one thing that we did in, um, in Lambda School uh, as sort of a, I guess, lesson into how to draw views like this was we had them find a logo that they wanted to emulate. And so uh, one easy one was just the Lambda School logo. Uh, it was, you know, kind of this uh, penta pentagonal shape with the, the Lambda inside, or kind of like the up the carrot inside of it. But other people went further beyond and found uh, logos to emulate that had curves and everything. And so they were using these control points. And it was really incredible to see, you know, uh, they, they didn't have hardly any experience at all. But if you grasp how these control points work and again going into an app like photoshop or affinity uh can be nice because it's really a visual it's a representation visual mm -hmm. of of that and um let's see it's um big nerd ranch has a great um i'll we'll we'll link it in the show notes they have a great couple um pages on like drawing and everything and ui bezier paths and showing they've got little gifs of how these control points work if you don't have an app uh, to mess around with yourself. So uh, really cool being able to, I, I love that we have these different levels of, of ease of use, basically. How much time do you want to spend on something to get whatever level of custom you want? Uh, a lot of times UI kit's great, uh, but if you need to, like Dimitri said, you can either kind of jump into that middle ground where uh, it's a UI kit method, but it's really just dropping down to core graphics for you. Or if you want all the control, you can do it yourself. And that's that's really cool. 
And historically, there was no UI Bezier path, despite right. NS Bezier path existing since forever ago. Um, UI Bezier path is relatively modern uh, by comparison. And on iOS, if you wanted to draw paths, you would need to use CG path ref, uh, which if you came into uh, iOS development after Swift, it might not look so different than UI Bezier path. It's just like different names. But if you're using it from Objective-C, it's a very different way of thinking about how you're calling methods and things like that. You're calling a function and you're passing a reference to the function every single time rather than telling uh, your object to do something. Um, right. So it's, it's a little backwards if you were not used to it. And I remember that being, if again, if you're not used to C, if you're used to Objective-C but not C, um, which it's, enti it's entirely possible to, uh, to uh, be that, uh, then it was a little awkward and backwards to use a lot of these methods because you're just not used uh, to what it's doing. Um, I wanted to bring up that uh, the PDF file format is essentially just giving instructions for how to build uh, these Bezier paths. Um, and Mac OS X, um, at least up until modern Mac OS X, uh, was actually based on uh, the PDF standard. So anytime you have a view uh, in your draw rect, you would give drawing instructions those would be generating PDF instructions under the hood. So if you wanted to print your view, oh. it would you can easily generate a PDF with no extra code. Like calling uh, NSBS your path would generate um, the postscript. That's the language that PDF uses under the hood. Uh, it would generate the postscript to generate that PDF. And therefore, you can go ahead and print your view. You can show it on the screen. You can do all sorts of things, which is why uh, Mac OS always had, Mac OS 10 specifically, always had like a PDF viewer built in because it was dead simple to uh, to implement at that point. So that's why oh, that's Preview cool. has always kind of been there. Um, so uh, you do have that level. And uh, as, as Spencer said, there are some pretty cool tools uh, to kind of visualize how Bezier paths work. They are quite intuitive. Uh, once you do start playing around with it and seeing like what dragging the control points does, um, you're basically modifying the tangents of a curve if you're mathematically oriented. Um, if you're not, it's just how curvy do you want it, basically. Uh, yeah. you, you, the further you drag after you make a point, that's much more curvy than being very straight and angular. Um, but there's a great tool called Paint Code, uh, which uh, oh, we'll yeah. also link in the show notes. Um, and that lets you visually draw out your shape and it will generate a UI Bezier path code for you to just copy and paste into your app. Um, so that is a very great way of um, prototyping out like what your view is going to be drawing ahead of time. So that way, when it comes time to doing the drawing, um, it's, it's all just ready for you. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned paint code. I, um, I had bought, I think it was just paint code two. I haven't looked at it in, in a couple of years probably, but um, it was really cool, especially, I, I will say I did kind of use it as a, a little bit of a crutch. Uh, to, for me, I learned about it way before I learned how to write core graphics code myself. Uh, so for me, I used it as a bit of a crutch and a, a way of saying, I don't really need to use this because I can use paint code. Um, so I definitely recommend, like Dimitri was saying, like, use it, but also look at the code and maybe look at some tutorials to, if you're not familiar with, uh, with core graphics, you know, how it actually works and what the code is doing so that uh, you can either tweak the code or um, just use it as a tool to help you learn, although it can be really nice for uh, more complex drawings for sure. Just kind of wanted to throw out there like, it's awesome, but also, well, like any tool, it can be used as a crutch. I, I guess it's not really specific to this either. Mm -hmm. um, now, I guess, so we talked about like basic shapes, like that's, you, you basically turn them all into Bezier curves. Um, you also have text. Um, and if you didn't know, text is a bunch, just like the logos that you mentioned that have curves in them, text is just a bunch more Bezier curves. Um, spoiler alert, it's all built on Bezier curves uh, down to uh, down to the very lowest level. Um, so uh, text, as I said, is a bunch of shapes. And you can go ahead and draw text by just asking the string to draw itself. Um, but you can also ask the system to give you back the shape 
of each letter if you wanted to do something more uh, complex, if you wanted to render it in a perspective or do some funky math to give it a little wavy pattern or whatever you wanted to do, you can go ahead and do that because text is just, again, a collection of Bezier curves. And if you've noticed, it's really fast to draw text on screen. So it's really fast to draw a ton of Bezier curves that you make yourself. Um, so uh, all of this is kind of built on the same primitives um, all the way down. The only thing is that Core Graphics and therefore AppKit and UIKit, uh, they are CPU rendering technologies. Like you are, you are prepping a bit of memory as, in the shape of a square, essentially representing uh, either a bunch of pixels if you're generating an image or a bunch of instructions if you're generating a PDF for printing, for instance. Um, and depending on what that context is, that's what the context object is, um, you are directly just asking the CPU to either render your shape or render the instructions. Um, and that, that is at that level. So uh, if you're doing a ton of drawing, like one after another onto that same patch, uh, you might not be able to get the best performance out of uh, these primitives because the CPU, although it is fast, it's not necessarily made for like highly paralyzed drawing. Um, so there are some limitations there. Now, uh, Swift UI is a little bit different. Um, and Spencer, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and I most definitely am, but there is a, uh, there is a modifier that you can place on your view hierarchy uh, that's basically called something along the lines of draw with metal. Um, I completely forgot what the, what the actual term is, but if you have any uh, drawing code in your Swift UI views, instead of drawing those on the CPU, it will go ahead and draw all your shapes on the GPU, and therefore you'll get a, a huge uh, performance boost um, with the trade-off that you're no longer working with individual views at the rendering level. You're working with a bunch of drawing commands to the GPU, uh, and therefore it kind of gets squished um, as, as like one context, um, instead of having all individual views that you can put like uh, accessibility and stuff on. So that is uh, something to think about uh, if you do want to use this, um, but you can get a huge amount of performance and that's because we're using the graphics processing unit, which is the GPU that's inside your computer. Um, so uh, Spencer, can you give like an overview of what a GPU is and why, why we have them? Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the view or the modifier that Dimitri was talking about is called a drawing group. Um, that's so, yeah, just just in case anyone was wondering. Yeah, so the GPU is basically made to uh, perform and execute, like Dimitri said, highly parallelized tasks where uh, you can break some task up into uh, many, many small pieces and kind of have them run at the same time. It's like having, you know, thousands of threads uh, on your CPU run at the same time because they're able to be broken up into smaller pieces where the CPU is great at just kind of powering through things and it has a few threads, but not, you know, it's not highly, highly parallelized. Um, so the GPU is kind of meant for those different tasks, um, like, like drawing views or, or whatever. So um, it's like Dimitri said, you can perform, uh, I mean, in theory, you can perform graphics processing on your CPU. It's just going to be way slower. You have way less uh, parallelized computing power. And so if you've ever um, used like a virtual machine, for example, a lot of times those like the operating system will be rendering or the, the virtual machine will be rendering everything on the CPU. It's not going to have a, a graphics processor. And so it's just very, very slow. Whereas mm. if you have this hardware that we all have on iPhones, iPads, Macs, um, that is the GPU, it's, it's made for that. It's just inherently going to be faster because it's broken up into many, many different cores. I, I don't know, I, I could be wrong here, but like GPUs nowadays have potentially thousands of, of computing units, or it depends on kind of the brand of the uh, graphics processor, what they call yeah, them. Yeah, what but, they call them. That's different for yeah. every single one. Yeah, Like Apple cores says, oh, or... we have eight cores, but there's right. a lot more computing units in each of right. those cores. Exactly. So it's a little bit hard to kind of define one specific term, but basically how many cores or computing units can it do, things can it do at the same time, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And the paralyzed task here is really 
operating on each pixel independently. So uh, the CPU, if you have an image, uh, that starts with the pixel at the top left and then goes all the way to the right, then one row down, all the way to the right, one row down, all the way to the right, and has to go one after another, rendering each one of those pixels. Whereas the GPU can basically say, okay, pixel on the top left, simultaneously, pixel on the next one over on the right. top left, simultaneously, just pixel starts on the top assigning. right. All of them are just going to shoot up at once and just draw whatever they need to draw. And right. typically it, it boils down to, hey, pixel, uh, are you going to render as red? Uh, and a lot of them are going to say no. A lot of them are going to say yes. Uh, and therefore, what you see after the fact is a, tri a red triangle uh, because the pixels that were in the triangle, uh, they were programmed to say yes to that question. And the ones that are outside the triangle, they were programmed to say no. Um, and instantly you have the result for all pixels all at once. Um, so GPU is great for drawing images, hence graphical processing in it, even though it's used for computing all sorts of things nowadays. Um, and that leads us into um, another set of technologies that we can use uh, to go ahead and render things. Namely, the first one that you're kind of probably familiar with uh, is core animation. So core animation will take a bunch of flat images that the CPU renders, um, and then it will go ahead and composite them on top of each other. Uh, so in on your screen, for instance, you have a ton of windows, um, and all those windows are kind of layered one after another. Um, what core, core Animation basically will do is treat each one of those layers, um, each one of those windows as a layer, um, which is a CA layer uh, in Core Animation terms. Uh, and that layer will be one bitmap, so one image, basically. Um, and the GPU, as we said, it can go ahead and run every pixel independently. So every pixel on your screen just has to determine, OK, am I showing a pixel for this window or for that window? Um, and it can very quickly just show what's on your screen. Um, and you can move your windows around, uh, and everything is nice and speedy. Before computers had graphics, uh, GPUs, you cannot live resize a window. You can move an outline of a window. Your window would still be on the <laughs> right. screen where it was. Uh, and as you drag your window, you see like an outline of where it's going to be. Or if you wanted to resize your window, you would see the outline of how big your window is going to be. Um, but you weren't like re-rendering the entire screen at once. You were just literally anything that needed to draw would draw directly to the screen. And everything else would be like, I'm not going to draw at this point. Uh, in time. Otherwise, it's going to cause all sorts of graphical glitches and things like that. So when we think of a glitch, it's basically a thing drawing that's not supposed to be drawing uh, to the screen. And core animation simplifies a lot of that uh, because it basically abstracts all the complex stuff that the GPU does into dealing with layers that just need to be composited one after another um, and ideally animated implicitly. So if you tell something to move over, it will go ahead and over time show that thing moving over because it can very quickly uh, render that. Whereas if you were to do an animation within core graphics, you would be doing a lot of work uh, to render each frame as it's needed uh, because the CPU is essentially going to start at that top left pixel and then just run through one after another for each frame. Whereas the GPU, as it finishes processing that first top left pixel, all the other pixels are already done. Um, So way faster in that regard. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, with with core, core animation, uh, probably one of the most basic things you could do, but just as an illustration of exactly what uh, uh, Dimitri said of you having to compute a lot of things if you were trying to do something with core graphics. Uh, let's say that you wanted to uh, change the background color of a view from like, uh, I don't know, red to green, and you wanted it to animate through all of the colors in between that, that would be a lot. If you said, I want it to go from red is as the starting point to green in one second, uh, there's a lot of colors that you'd have to figure out for every single frame uh, in between there. But with core animation, you say, uh, go from this color to this color and start the animation and it just runs through and it will do it for you. Mm -hmm. And you can even get even more complex and say, add keyframes. So maybe you have your animation for one second and from, uh, you know, second zero time, yeah, zero to uh, half a second is going from green to red or red to green. And then you go from green to blue or something. Uh, so you can do many, many complex things. And 
really you're just saying go from here this value to this value to you know however many keyframes you have and that's all you need to do much less work of trying to figure out okay i, I need to render this frame and then this frame then this frame then this frame with all with different colors if that makes sense if that's a good example mm -hmm. using keyframes is basically providing a custom function uh for uh whatever animation that you want to do um and it lets you take a lot more control over the timing and what the result is for a particular time right. um so core animation gives you all that power um and uh it used to be like again that you had to choose when you wanted to use core animation especially on mac os ios has never had this problem it's always been 100 percent core animation uh but from on mac os you had to choose which views had to participate or could participate in core animation. Nowadays, it's basically everything, unless you tell it, no, please don't. Um, and then it's, it's basically gonna put, give every view its own layer. Um, but you needed to make this decision because if every view is essentially drawing its contents, uh, that was not necessarily drawn into its own layer that could have been drawn into the super views uh, content. So draw rect would basically iterate downward to all the subviews and tell each individual button to draw itself. And then the button would tell its individual subcomponents to draw themselves um, one view at a time, and that would make up um, the main view. Uh, so uh, core animation simplified all of that. Um, and it's a good thing it simplified it because the alternative, uh, if you wanted to get some good performance like this, would have been to use something like OpenGL uh, which is right. basically giving raw drawing commands to the GPU. Uh, so what does that look like? Well, you tell the GPU, I want to draw this triangle. So uh, a triangle given by these three points at with this color, and it will go ahead and draw that instantly. Um, it has no problem doing that kind of operation. You just need to figure out how to turn what you want to do into a bunch of triangles that can be drawn one after another and that's where the gpu excels and that's how you can get 3d graphics because 3d graphics is just triangles kind of interconnected and overlaid in three-dimensional space you can flatten that three-dimensional space and you get an image uh basically so um that's that's been about as much as i understand about 3d graphics in a nutshell um and uh opengl made it quite hard to do more complicated things um with that system so if you wanted to get like shadows that would be faked there is no such thing as a real shadow uh from the point of view of uh these earlier graphic systems you would draw another shape on the ground that looks like it could be a shadow but it's not actually a shadow that we're kind of used to um physically rendering it um nowadays there are uh there are tools called uh ray tracing and things like that that can take care of all those details for you at tremendous computational cost, um, basically simulating every photon that's flying around in your three-dimensional scene. Um, but uh, many applications basically cheat and use a shortcut uh, to get there. Um, so that brings in us into an interesting, um, an interesting uh, field, and that is the field of like optical illusions. So for instance, sometimes you can get away drawing a lot using just core animation layers. So for instance, if you have a layer uh, that represents a, let's say you want to draw a, uh, a bar chart. So uh, each individual bar would show you how much of something sold over a period of time, for instance. You could draw a series of rectangles in your draw rect, but that wouldn't be animatable, right? As you change parameters and you wouldn't be able to see the bars change size and stuff like that. So instead of drawing rectangles, you can basically position layers and you're not drawing anything in these layers. You're just saying, hey, this layer, it has a background color, it has a corner radius, uh, and that's all you're telling it. Uh, and it has a shape, this height, um, this these dimensions. Uh, and you can go ahead and animate something very easily just doing that. Um, if you needed to put a, a small highlight or a shadow next to something, you can just put a one pixel layer that's really long and skinny um, right next to something, and that's your instant highlight or shadow. Um, so a lot of tricks uh, to get good performance actually come from just throwing in layers or views uh, here or there um, with just solid properties, no actual images uh, contained with them. And then the GPU or core animation will translate that to really simple drawing commands. Um, and the GPU will be able to render that very quickly, even though it's being composited on top of all sorts of things. Yeah, that reminds me of... Um... 
just doing similar things, kind of going again high level, but similar things to Swift UI, where uh, you'll try to like mimic, uh, uh, yeah, neomorphic design or whatever, where your eye kind of sees this as like, oh, this has this lighter shadow, this has this darker shadow on each kind of uh, corner, but really it's just a rectangle with a slightly different color where you can you can kind of trick your eyes into seeing things that really aren't more complex than just a shape, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I guess to that extent, it really helps to study a little bit about color theory and how like actual shadows and stuff work. So for instance, we think of shadows as being a dark color and highlights being a light color, um, like pure white or pure black uh, kind of thing. Uh, in reality, it's a lot more interesting. Like whatever the color of your walls are is going to influence the color of your shadow, for instance. Um, so if you have blue walls, your shadow is actually going to be blue, but your eyes are going to interpret that as being black. Um, so if you make that shadow black, it's going to look off because your eyes are going to interpret it as being more blue than they're supposed to be so you're going to end up in the opposite end of the color spectrum uh, and that can be really jarring for users uh, so always consider what kind of background you're using uh, when you apply shadow don't just blindly choose transparent black or transparent right. white to have a highlight pick something along the hue of the views around it um, and that's usually going to help you tremendously uh, you can also go in the opposite direction and be creative where you pick a different hue uh, but be careful with how you use that because it can either work to great effect or it can it can uh, not work at all um, and that that is something that you need to consider uh, when you are kind of deciding um, how to how to layer these elements essentially yeah i'm gonna kind of contradict myself here i just said that the eye is really easy to trick but at the same time it's really hard to trick in some things like there's like this it's very easy for it to notice like this uncanny valley this takes mm -hmm. me back to uh, m one of my classes in college where i can't exactly remember what it was i think it was just like a want to call it 2d design i can't quite remember but there was this um someone had presented a um a i think it was just a painting like a watercolor painting anyway it was of mountains and they were they were layered right and so mm -hmm. there were some kind of in front of each other and the color didn't look right between the mountains and what was happening was he was making them darker the closer that they got but really uh and they they didn't quite look right and it, it's exactly what you were saying he was just kind of putting more black uh or making you know it darker but it didn't quite look right uh so the further back it went obviously it went lighter but it was like white um but then our teacher explained or our professor explained the reason it doesn't look right is because you have this blue sky and the blue sky is influencing the shadow on the mountains and so as the mountains get farther away they will uh, naturally get closer to the color of the sky and it mm -hmm. kind of blew my mind I was like oh my gosh I didn't realize that but our eyes did like I didn't realize it, but like naturally I was like, there's something not quite right with this. And so if there's if you feel like that with your design, it's probably something that other people would notice as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't claim at all to be an expert in any of this, but I have noticed um, just from that example that I, I've seen this like uncanny valley and you can definitely. Uh, try to you know try to avoid it whenever you can and um, mm -hmm. if, if I think you don't know then oh go for it and no, the biggest example of this is anytime people have shadows that are diagonal that immediately throws people off because generally the lights are above you so anytime you're expecting to see a shadow you expect it to be below an element not below and to the right because yep. rarely are the shadows in the top left or the light in <laughs> the top left to cast those kinds of shadows. So anytime people have those kinds of UIs, the reason it doesn't feel right, like it, even if you can't explain it, you're going to notice that mm, that's yeah, not the best exactly. design. Like if you were to put two side by side. Um, so like be careful with how many shadows and things that you put, because unless you do the whole work, make it a soft shadow with a hard shadow behind it and then a highlight on top of it, it's, you're not going to, if you don't go all the way, you're going to end up in that uncanny valley area and it's going to yeah. be very easy to uh, have something that just looks unfinished and incomplete uh, compared to what you were kind of going for um, if you did have 
an idea in mind and it, it's it's definitely tough and the oh yeah the biggest thing i would i would encourage anyone to do is go through these hurdles like don't don't stop yourself from having bad design but be critical of your own design so that way you can improve it over time it like using the tools to draw exactly what you want to draw gets easier the more you use them that's mm -hmm. that's unquestionable but training your eye to kind of figure out why something looks right versus why something looks wrong that actually takes training and uh, hard work to kind of uh, develop the skills to be able to do that properly and to be able to correct whatever is wrong because sometimes you have no idea what's like that just yeah. didn't turn out right after you like finish the whole idea um, and it's disheartening sometimes uh, but as you keep studying different things different techniques make a collection of your favorite uis and be able to spot like where they fall apart like that's going to help you a lot uh, when you are making UIs if you're concentrating on uh, doing that well, um, especially with things like shadows and textures and highlights, uh, metal reflections. Uh, those are notorious where if you if you do it even a little bit wrong, we're so used to seeing like chrome on a motorcycle that we will notice immediately if if a binder ring, for instance, does not look right because it's supposed to be shiny metal and it doesn't look like shiny metal. It looks like a gray shape. Um, so if you want to go realistic, you need to be very careful with how you're like using all these things. But if you want to escape all that, you can go with a stylized design and then you don't need to worry about any of that. Um, yeah. so, uh, that, that's a second, uh, a second, um, thing that I, I would encourage is if you can develop a clean, simple design system, meaning everything is kind of consistent in one way or another then you can take a lot of shortcuts in terms of getting everything perfect because our brains are very easy to influence into accepting something that does not look 100% real that but looks completely right. fine um uh like i would say a, a great example of this is cartoons if you look at a cartoon you see people you completely understand that these are people they don't look like people but you understand them to be people and your brain is a okay with that the minute they start looking like super realistic um like if if a 3d character in a disney movie for instance had smaller eyes that more closely resembled the proportions of an actual human face it would look wrong because they wouldn't be able to get it close enough to 100 percent a real human where it would look right but if they instead replace the eyes with much larger eyes, much smaller noses, much rounder faces and things like that, it looks far enough from reality that our brains are just tricked. So yeah. uh, do try to find a consistent style that you can uh, that you can be consistent with. That's the key. If you're not consistent with it, then it looks like it's all over the place. But that is a good cop out of having a perfectly realistic design um, and uh, that's a great way of having something that works quite well. Yeah. Um, real quick before we move on, I just wanted to say, um, uh, really echo what Dimitri said. And a huge thing is just iterations um, are, are key because, I, I don't know, for me, whenever I draw something, I don't have the patience to see it through and maybe like try to improve on it the next time. Um, mm -hmm. That's just, I don't know, I don't have patience for drawings, but I'll have patience for tweaking uh, like UI. And so uh, run through and try to design something. And then if it doesn't quite look right, iterate on it. Like if you want to go back to it, commit that, push it, um, and then, you know, mess it up and you'll always have something to go back to. But that way you can keep learning and do some comparing and contrasting to see what looks better. Um, and a great thing to do also with, uh, with design is look for inspiration. Like Dimitri said, have some collection, like something like, um, dribble, uh, .com, dribble with three B's, uh, is fantastic because not only do they have just graphic design and everything, but they have a specific, um, like mobile and I think web category that you can go on and people have designed these absolutely insane, um, UIs from a developer standpoint. Some might say. <laughs> exactly. But what they can give you is a, a good sense of, oh, this is how the shadows look on here. I could do mm -hmm. that for my views, right? Kind of steal little pieces out of it, not necessarily. Recreate it say, even. 
take yes, their design and, and recreate it not to show off or anything but to just practice like building up those shadows and textures layer after layer after layer like unless unless someone shows you how they do it it's kind of insane how many shapes there are on a single piece oh, yeah. of shiny metal a single piece of shiny metal is not a shape with a gradient on it it is a shape with 20,000 shapes on top that make <laughs> it look like shiny metal but right like as you watch them do it it's kind of haphazard they're not following any any sort of thing it's just by having lots of shapes on there it makes it look shinier and shinier and shinier as long as they're all like consistent and things like that yeah so we um at lambda school we had i think it was for spring break if i remember right we had like the students had a week off we were still working um and the instructors could sign up to like give kind of this spring break workshop just for fun and so one thing that uh, one that i led was uh, implementing a design from Dribble uh, in Swift UI, and that was like when Swift UI was really new. We kind of had a tough time; it didn't go super well. But it was one of those crazy designs where we got pretty dang close to making it functional mm -hmm. in Swift UI. And I think now is a perfect time to be able to iterate because uh, Swift UI is just so fast for iteration. You mm -hmm. want to change? Yeah, it gives the you a live preview. Yeah, you get the live preview. It's it's instant feedback where those iterations can happen so much faster than you having to. Uh, you know, run the simulator, go to the view that you're looking for or whatever. So uh, definitely, like, I just want to echo again what Dimitri said is just because we're saying it's maybe hard to either get it out of the uncanny valley uh, if you want to go into reality and making something realistic, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try because you, mm -hmm. you it's good practice and also people have done it before and you can kind of lean off of the people who have done it and see how they do it or at least try to mimic it and that will definitely help you as well. Yeah, I I think I've, I've said the story before, uh, but um, when iOS 7 came about, they had this brand new, flat, boring uh, interface uh, compared to iOS 6, which was full <laughs> of texture uh, and uh, like very skillful um, reproductions of real life things. Mm. Um, it took me up until iOS 6 to finally get good at drawing a leather bound with stitches all in vector uh, backgrounds for like the apps that I was making. Um, and then I had to just get rid of all that to do <laughs> iOS 7. And that made me so mad, um, but progress. Um, now I would go ahead and say that if you are practicing these uh, more skeuomorphic things, don't go down the road of like having a leather bound with stitches uh ui that makes that it makes no sense to have uh which is where ios 6 was to be frank um but <laughs> if you are designing a certain object and you do want to have that realism don't feel constrained by the flat you can go ahead and integrate a lot of these things into today's apps um and as long as you consider like different screen sizes where a lot of that was a nightmare but as long as you go into it considering all that from the beginning uh, then you can go ahead and make something that is truly unique by today's standards. Like not much uh, is really super highly uh, designed uh, in terms of like representing something that is not just a flat rectangle on top of another flat rectangle um, or rounded rectangles with gradients. Like that's, that's yeah. super common nowadays. It's kind of overdone um, to the point where nothing is really unique. If you do want to go to the unique aspect, say you're making a music player model it after something that plays music like a radio you can have a lot of fun with that even if the whole ui is not like based on that theme if some of your ui is and you can see the the speaker uh kind of pulse as it's kind of playing yeah. you can have a lot of fun making something that's very personal that people will love because what's not to love about uh that kind of care that's put into it um so you need like all these graphic tools to be able to pull that off um, and there are quite a few, um, and we kind of got like distracted by talking about design, um, but uh, it is definitely worth it. And I don't think it's uh, considered old or cheesy anymore. I think it's been long enough, like eight years at this point, right? iOS seven to fifteen. That's that's roughly eight years. Um, yeah, something for like that. for seven, eight, nine, ten, so nine years. 
um, uh, well, I guess after I was 15 is out for a while, that would be nine, eight, nine years of boring flat stuff. So yeah. be, be creative and don't overdo it. Um, and you can, you can take advantage of the fact that nothing else really does this anymore, uh, to really have something that's nice and polished. And it doesn't matter if you don't get there right away. Do keep in mind that even though you should practice as much as possible, don't always ship what is unfinished, uh, especially in terms of if it encroaches on Uncanny Valley uh, kind of perspectives, that can make things worse. And if you're actually trying to ship and make a profit off of your app, that is not ideal um, yeah. to have something that scares people away. Um, but And it's hard. As, yeah. I mean, like just the, these last couple of days at work, I've been um, tweaking some Swift UI designs uh, that I worked on a, a, like a month ago, I have spent so much time just sitting there tweaking the Swift UI that it's ridiculous how much time I've spent doing that as opposed to, you know, a couple days ago, I was blowing through a bunch of bugs and, and you know, tr fixing other things where I, it feels so slow to me, these iterations. But that's ultimately what you need to do. It's, for me, design is, it's fun, but it's also probably the most tedious thing that I can think of, I'd probably rather be working on other features or something, but it's not something that we can ignore. And I think that is a huge part of what makes iOS and macOS nice is there has been this attention to design and not just throwing together something and making it, you know, bland. I mean, well, yeah, I'm generalizing here, but more than like a, a Windows app where they all look the same, that kind of thing. People, you know, take the time and, and care to really have thoughtful design, both from a user uh, interface standpoint and also user experience, of course, as well. Mm -hmm. And and I, I, I should also say it's very important on the topic of design to keep things familiar. Like don't go and reinvent uh, how a button should yeah. behave or operate. Um, like a button in UI sense is based off of a button on a physical device. You push it in, uh, it has all of these connotations that we're really used to. Um, and if we see a button somewhere, we know how it operates. We know that you can click it, but then if you move your mouse away or move your finger away, you can cancel that interaction. Be very careful if you're like re-implementing things to follow all of those uh, interactions properly. Yeah, I think a lot of user experience things just don't even need to be really touched in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're re-implementing something, study what is already there. Really learn about how it works and what the pitfalls that Apple went through when they built out that control to begin with. So that way, if you do re-implement it, you make sure to check all those boxes, including accessibility, dynamic yeah. text, all sorts of uh, things uh, increased contrast um, that you should be uh, pay attention to. And thankfully, SwiftUI makes it easy to kind of do a lot of that. The button is like super plain. There's nothing to an actual button other than the behavior. So you can decide what your button looks like. Um, but the behavior is always kind of built in. Um, and I really enjoy that SwiftUI does that because, for instance, in AppKit, if you want to customize a button up until uh, Mac OS 12, uh, which is coming out later this uh, fall, uh, it was more or less a nightmare to kind of get everything working just right because you would have to dig into private calls to redraw something the way it needs to be drawn 10 years ago, and it was it was a mess. Uh, so things are much nicer nowadays, uh, thankfully. Um, so you should, I encourage everyone to kind of take advantage of the customizations that are there, but if they're not, you can always recreate something. Just be sure to nail down not just the look but also the behavior um, because ultimately it all comes down to all of that if you use a remote with like a mushy button it's going to feel bad like you don't want to be using that remote you want to use the remote with the clicky button because it feels good to click it but if it's too hard to click then there's going to be a remote that makes you tired so there's all sorts of trade-offs both in real life but also in ui design especially a button that you can't cancel it's like oh shoot uh, I don't want to buy this thing, but as you move your finger away, uh, it decides to buy it anyway. So you don't want that situation. You're going to make people angry. Um, although you might make <laughs> a few extra bucks for like a little bit, you're going to get booted quite quickly from like making people angry. So um, yeah. always consider all those things. Definitely. 
So this week's episode is once again brought to you by Bon Voyage, a, a full stack iOS application development course from Johnny B. With this course, you'll learn how to build both a full iOS client app and an associated React web administration application. The app and the site will integrate with Firebase as well as Stripe and Plaid uh, for payment processing. Bon Voyage is a place to book extravagant vacations and you'll gain the skills to build the iOS app from the ground up and integrate everything you need to provide a world-class vacation booking experience. To find out more and sign up for the course, visit bonvoyage.app slash course. That's b-o-n-v-o-y-a-g-e dot app slash course. And be sure to follow Bon Voyage's instructor at Johnny B Codes. That's at J-O-N-N-Y-B-C-O-D-E-S on Twitter to stay up to date with all his courses. Thanks again to Bon Voyage e-commerce app course for sponsoring code completion. So now that we've gone through our topics, it's time for Complete the Code, where we quiz our listeners on your knowledge of Swift, Apple, and all things development. Since we had no winner for last week yet, and we kind of just started recording right after we released last week's episode, so no one had a chance to write in yet, (laughs) uh, let's go over the prompt one more time. Spencer? Yeah, so uh, this time we've got a function called do the cool thing uh, that takes two parameters, uh, name and food, and returns a cooler thing. So which key command in Xcode will build a template documentation comment uh, for this function? So very straightforward. There's lots of key commands in Xcode that you can memorize, lots of very useful ones. What's the one to build a documentation comment? So that way you can follow documentation-driven development uh, hey. first coined on the show and then popularized by Apple, possibly <laughs> never originating from the show. Uh, anyways, uh, can you complete the code? Uh, tweet your answers to us with hashtag uh, complete the code, all one word. Uh, the first to get it right, we'll get a shout out on uh, next week's show. So as always, I want to personally thank everyone for listening in this week. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Code Completion to know when new episodes get released and feel free to tweet at us if there is a topic you'd like for us to get into. Uh, so most importantly, as a small t- podcast, please uh, rate us on Apple Podcasts and uh, tell all your friends uh, to give us a listen. Uh, that way we can keep on the discussion and uh, go over more topics over time. So once again, I want to give my thanks to Spencer, who is at Spencer C. Curtis. That's S-P-E-N-C-E-R-C-C-U-R-T-I-S on Twitter for joining me this week. My name, once again, is Dimitri. You can follow me at Dimitri Bunyol. That's D-I-M-I-T-R-I-B-O-U-N-I-O-L. And we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye.